Hello, and welcome to the um, rescheduled Thursday, March 15th, regular school board meeting. Um, will you please uh, stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance with us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, uh, first, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, um, may I have a motion for approval of school board minutes? I move we approve the school board minutes as listed in our packet under item two. I second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Um, next are uh, comments from our student representatives. Hi everyone, um, it's sort of been a while. I'm happy to be back though. Um, so we just wanted to give you a couple quick updates. Uh, to start off this weekend, um, four students from Cape Elizabeth are going to a conference um, known as Can We? Um, and it's a journey to explore ex and experiment with civic dialogue across differences. Um, I think it's a very pertinent thing that we talk about um, in this time, and it's sponsored by Wayne Fleet, um, but like I said, six other schools are going, so it should be a very interesting event. Um, in addition, a group of students tomorrow will be attending the third Model UN Conference of the year, um, and it's at Boston College. So the students have been preparing and researching um, with the help of Ms. Oliver, and they'll leave tomorrow morning to go to that conference. Um, also, I'm happy to announce that I, um, along with two students, Liv Cochran and Isaac Dinnerstein, will be attending Seeds of Peace this summer. Um, we just found out this earlier this week, um, and we're very excited about well, congratulations. that. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. And to bring that idea back to Cape Elizabeth. Um, also, a group of 20 students um, from Club Unify and National Honor Society have been working together to raise money for um, Strive Rocks, which is um, the biggest fundraiser of the year for an organization that offers um, programs for students with disabilities to attend anywhere from, they actually have a college program to um, Wednesday night educational series. Um, so they offer like a wide variety of things, a social night, um, and I've been lucky enough to volunteer there and it's just such a cool organization. So this year, so far, the group has actually raised over $4,000, um, and we will be attending that event next Saturday. Um, so we're really excited about that. Emily's also attending. And the NHS has done fundraising. We've done um, poinsettias, sales around Christmas, and we did candy grams for during, I think also during Christmas, like candy canes. Um, and we've, our group has been really excited about going to Stripe. That's something that, has become more of a, um, an organization that's become more apparent to our community, our school, our high school community in the last couple of years. Um, Allison's done a lot of really awesome work with Strive and I have a bunch of friends who are really, really passionate about it too and so it's really exciting that we're able to fundraise for something so close to home and that we'll get to attend the event also that we've been fundraising for all year. Um, and so, just moving on, the Student Affairs Council has been collecting donations for a raffle um, that will go towards the annual scholarship we give out. So what we're planning on doing is each grade is gonna have um, baskets of, like, that have different themes, and they're gonna have, so like, a beach theme, and it'll be like beach passes, and I don't know, like, gift cards to beach, like, yeah, I don't flip -flops. know. Yeah, yeah, flip flops. Yeah, yeah, flip flops, like stuff like that. Um, and then we have, like, a prom theme and a winter theme. Um, so that's really exciting and we think that's gonna be a really great way to raise money for the scholarship. Yeah, and we're selling them at the Jazz Cabaret um, next Friday night, so. And the 
morale has remained high in the high school even after some of the incidents that have occurred in the past few weeks. Um, staff and administration have urged conversation and kept an open line of dialogue, which is really important and we as students really appreciate that we think Mr. Shedd and the administration have done a, re a really, really amazing job on. Um, so sports updates, the last, unfortunately, the ho boys hockey team lost their conference final to Greeley um, and Lewiston, but it was really exciting actually because they went to Lewiston on a Friday night and then they won that game and then they went back on a Tuesday and I, I think there were probably 20 or 30 students that attended both games and it's in Lewiston so it's a pretty big commitment, a pretty big time commitment, but it was really fun to cheer them on. Everyone loves going to the hockey games and attending sports games. Um, in terms of snow days, they have been <laughs> difficult for especially, I feel like, seniors um, because we're going on the AP Gov trip next week. And so, at least in, in my AP classes, the teachers have been really pressing us to um, take all of our tests that we have missed four or five class days of study time, um, which is frustrating and difficult, but I think there's yeah. nothing you can really do. there's nothing you can really do about it. We have to take the test. So for juniors too, especially in AP classes, as Emily was saying, it's so hard because like that test date in May isn't going to move mm -hmm. um, based on our snow days. So we really do have to cram to get all that information in. Um, but it is what it is. <laughs> do you want to talk about that? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the last thing we wanted to address was the walkout today. Um, I would say probably close to 100 students. Um, a lot more? Yeah, I'm not going to estimate. <laughs> um, walked out from class today at 10 p.m. Um, to honor the victims. We had Kim Noft, uh, a junior at the school. Um, she started off um, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the event. With a song, and it was very, very nice. It's um, really powerful. And then we, um, there were 17 students, um, and they all lined up and gave a brief um, bio on one, each one of the victims, um, and that was really powerful too. Um, and then Christy Gillies, um, a representative from the Maine Gun Coalition, um, and Tori McGrath and Tony Inhorn all gave. Um, really powerful speeches. They were the three that um, organized the event primarily. Just short about the importance of voting and just smiling at people in the hallway and being an active bystander instead of a passive bystander um, or, and being an advocate um, and just, I don't know, it was really, really powerful and really moving and I just think it was really awesome that one, that we had the school support. I think regardless of the school support, I still would have walked out of class. Um, regardless of the punishment that I received, that's something I feel really strongly about. And, but it was really, really great to see staff and administration standing behind us and supporting us. Yeah, I agree. I, through Students of Peace, I have connections with students at a lot of different schools and hearing their like troubles with their administration regarding this event, yeah, um, made me just feel really lucky for um, where we are and the support we have behind us when these type of things happen. I think that's it. Thank you. It was re really well done, really well done, <coughs> and you're right, so powerful. Thank you all for putting it on again on two days after, or a day after it was scheduled. Mm -hmm. right. Quick comment and question. First of all, congratulations on the the way the students are organized the walk out, I have a lot of admiration for that. I think whichever side of this you happen to come down, these are the kind of things that you're actually going to remember long after you leave school. And it's, I think it's in that respect, it's really important. I was lucky to not participate myself as a student, similar types of things at that time. Um, and then the last brief thing, when's the Jazz Cabaret? What's the date and time? You sort of mentioned you're fundraising at it, but you didn't have actually date, time, and place. It's next Friday. I believe it oh, starts okay. at 6.30. Yeah. At what location? That's 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 cool. TL was really stressed because we get back from, um, TL is Tom Lazat, he's, our, he's the 
um, band teacher, and he was really stressed because so many of the students that participate in the jazz cabaret are also going on the AP Gov trip, and we get back at 12.30 on Friday, and so he was, of course, really stressed. Oh, also, we were supposed to have a band concert tonight, but it was canceled, and that's really sad, but we have another one in May, so. Can't do it all. <laughs> yeah, especially when you miss three days. Yeah, especially when yeah. we were not ready. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, number four, comments from the public on agenda items. Seeing so no public. <laughs> uh, moving on to communications. <laughs> Principal bless updates. You. God bless you. Would any of the principals like to update? Hi, good evening. Good to see everyone tonight. Um, so I'm also tonight going to be sharing a few comments from um, Troy Eastman as he's not feeling well and needed to um, begin his 80 minute commute back home, so um, I have a little, uh, some things from him. So uh, as we move into spring, I mean, this whole year has been extremely busy, but it's getting even busier, and it's getting more and more exciting, too. Uh, we recently began um, our placement process. We're already starting to plan for class lists for 2018-19, and so we uh, began that this week by asking parents for feedback. Um, and, around their, their child's learning styles, likes, dislikes, hopes. So we've started that and, and the staff at Pond Cove will be working on that for the next few months, going through a series of steps. Uh, it's, a, it's a process that we take very seriously and we, we are committed to providing, to creating an optimal learning environment for all students by creating balanced um, classrooms, the best that we possibly can. Uh, so also the Empower Me state assessments are coming up um, and so third and fourth graders um, will be tested with, um, will be assessed with fourth grade students being assessed in math and literacy. The window is March 20th to the 28th and they'll have a few different sessions of testing sometime within that window and then grade three from March 29th to April 9th. Um, and so in preparation for that, uh, um, you know, although we see great value in the assessments, and and uh, but we also are very careful about how we message um, the purpose of the assessments to students. And and one of the steps we're taking, um, in addition to talking with teachers about how to how to talk with their students about the upcoming assessments, we're actually having um, Bree Gallagher, our guidance counselor, do in third and fourth grade do a short series of activities with kids around kind of anxiety that can come from those types of assessments and so we're trying to kind of be proactive and we, we want it, students to do their best but we we want them to um, be excited about showing us their best and not feel stress and pressure so that's the goal um, we continue to discuss safety and security in the building um, we've very recently um, formed up some some we revise some of our plans um, that have been in place for years and um, we're meeting with teach teams of teachers and talking about those plans at the building level now. Um, and we've been doing that for about a week and we're continuing meeting with all the teams, answering questions. Um, it's been hard to get the staff all together with the snow days, our staff meetings are canceled. Um, but what one of our, um, one thing we're focusing on now is um, putting a solid system in place to ensure that substitute teachers are well versed in procedures, can access the procedures easily. So that's kind of what we're focusing on this week. Um, and so I have one more thing, I promise I won't take too much longer. Um, I think I have kind of an inspiring story here from one of our students and th I, I think a common theme that I've tried to share is that um, we at Pond Cove, we really look for opportunities to have student-led initiatives. We've had um, different fundraisers throughout the year that I've explained, like the, the Give Green, Wear Green, and, and donations to the Barbara Bush Hospital. All, um, all those ideas come from students. And so 
Um, I have another example of a student leader here, um, Lena Robbins. She's in third grade. She's in Mrs. Adams' class. And I wanted just to read um, an email, a quick short email that she sent to Mrs. Flory Pettit, which has inspired this, our community to, to um, um, embark in another um, journey here. So I'm just going to read it, and um, it'll be quick. Hi, I'm Lena, and I moved to Cape Elizabeth in August from Chicago. I really like it here and have noticed that people are really giving. At my old school, we always did service projects, so I joined caring kids here and really liked the projects. I thought, let's do more. Preble Street in Portland helps teens and adults when things, with things that they need when they may be going through a tough time. My goal is that every kid in the school brings at least one th thing during the week of the drive, so it's a drive for Preble Street. Together as kids, we can help a lot. So this came from her, I called her um, mom, and she said that this all came from her, the idea, the email. Um, the email came with an attached flyer, and so we're actually doing this. Um, and I will be advertising it more, um, asking every student to bring one item um, for, to donate April 23rd through the 22nd. We have, uh, we reached out to Preble Street and we have a representative coming on the 27th to, to meet Lena and accept. So uh, this is another example of, um, you know, we're not necessarily just raising future leaders, but these many students, like these young ladies here are leaders right now. So I wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you. And Troy had, I'm just going to read a few bullet points from Troy. He wanted to celebrate um, middle school robotics team is headed to the world by winning the middle school excellence award during the Maine state championship. Um, the chess team competed in, in the K-6 championships at the University of Maine at Orono and finished as runners up. Um, next week kicks off no name calling week sponsored by our student council with an assembly on Friday by Brandon Baldwin from the State Attorney General's office. Sound like there's a lot of positive things going on. Um, and then he just notes that we're, he's also um, starting the Empower Me testing um, next week for grades six, eight. Um, and then grades five and seven will test the week after them. So that's what Troy had, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, thank you for creating an atmosphere where the kids feel like they can come to you and bring these great ideas forward. Thank you. So I had three very different things that I, I wanted to touch on, and one I wanted to mention, um, an unsung hero award for me of a person in Keep Elizabeth who a lot of people don't know, I've never had the opportunity to work with and wouldn't recognize if he walked into the room. And he has been so instrumental in our journey towards proficiency-based education, I'll love it or hate it, and that is Dean Zaharis, who is one of our technology absolute gurus. He has made PowerSchool do so many things that it is not designed to do, um, and he has tweaked it um, in response to requests from Kathy and I, that are usually consistent and sometimes not consistent, and she's worked that out. I mean, he has um, made how grades work. They're not supposed to, but he's made them work. He's created an at-risk report using how grades. Um, he has um, recently added a table which actually separates out how grades from academic grades, which I think makes the understanding of the assessments that kids are getting much clearer. Um, he's created a system of red flags. Um, which was just a stupid dream that we had, and he made it happen. All of a sudden, there are red flags to tell kids that there's something you, you might want to be concerned about and, and, and click, click a number and you'll find some more details. Um, he has created a learning targets grades table um, that is remarkable, doesn't exist in power school. This is all his programming that he is doing. Um, he is in, oh, he had, oh, Several years ago, he invented our achievement period claiming system, um, which has been a remarkable thing. Um, he's tweaked all of these things many times, and he's recently, he also created um, a tentative eligibility report that we use as the basis for sort of um, following up with the school board policy about eligibility. His sidekick this year, who is in training, is Andrea Fuller, um, who many of you do know. Um, 
but, but the two of them just do remarkable, remarkable work, and I just wanted to mention his name. Um, I wanted to separately um, thank teachers this year. This is sort of related because we have, teachers at the high school this year have been on this journey to proficiency-based education, and, and we went into it knowing certain things, but knowing there'd be a lot that we would have to learn along the way. And it has created a lot of additional work on the part of teachers, some frustrations as we try to tweak the system to make it better, to make it cleaner, to make it simpler. Um, in addition to that, they've had, um, as everybody has across the district, snow days and no power days and, and, um, and, and school threat days off. Um, they've had a walkout today, which they were very supportive of, by the way. Um, they've rolled with a lot of punches, and I just wanted to say thank you publicly to teachers for um, the work that they've done, because they are really being asked to take on more and more and more and more, um, and they have come through. And then the last thing I wanted to do in connection with the walkout is to say that I don't think I've ever been proud of a group of students, and I speak about the student body as a whole, uh, but I also wanted to mention in particular four students um, who were sort of the, the prime organizers of it, and Christy Gillies um, was definitely one, Tony Inhorn, um, Tori McGrath, and then Lily Frame was a part of it as well. So those four showed remarkable commitment and dedication, and what happened today was all them and all the students at Cape Elizabeth High School. It was a, it was a really proud moment, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. What a applaud. I just want to say thank you so much. Right? Amazing. I know, I know that's not really conventional, but yay. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to the, um, the budget update. <laughs> Who does that? I, I don't know. It's down here. Uh, <laughs> Let's pass. Let's, let's have an adjustment to the agenda. Let's see. Let's just take that off because that's we're having a workshop afterwards. I think that's the mix-up. So now we'll do superintendent's report. Okay. Um, well, um, the first thing on my list also was the uh, walkout. I, I don't need to say more. Um, other than I just want to, I guess all I want to say is, is uh, I also was was very proud of our students, um, both those that that. I had a, a, a leading role, but those that were in the audience, everybody was very respectful and 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 uh, conducted themselves as young gentlemen and women, ladies. And I just was very uh, proud to just say, my gosh, look at these young people. They are, they're, they're, I, I have a lot of confidence in them. And so that was very nice. I would mention that tomorrow apparently is the middle school walkout. Uh, New England is uh, a day or two off the schedule <laughs> for obvious reasons, um, but that will be held tomorrow, I believe, in front of the middle school. And um, okay, so the next thing I want to mention is that I received a letter the other day from um, Main School Management Association um, letting me know that they as an organization have um, contracted with Drebin Whitsum a, 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 a major law firm here in the area to provide some kind of assistance to certain school districts, and we're one of them, um, with respect to looking for ways to to reduce um, claims of, and, and um, litigation that can be quite expensive, and it impacts their rates when and it, and it impacts ours, and so it's a proactive effort, and so. Our director of special um, education services, Jessica Clark, and if not all, a number of our special education teachers will be offered a one-day training sometime this spring. And I think that's uh, that's very good. Um, you know that we continue to work along with this regional service center idea. I was at a meeting last Monday where everyone in the room, there's a lot of districts involved in this right now, are feeling as if they're being, they're feeling rushed. And there's an April deadline that people said, you know what, I don't think that we need to just be chasing that deadline. There's another opportunity for what's called phase two next November. And so they want to keep meeting. I mean, we're meeting every single week. This is not, um, this is a serious commitment. But um, just know that 
we are not going to be, as a group, putting in a formal application for phase two next month, but there's every intention of going forward with November, and even if funding were not available, perhaps it would make sense for the districts collectively to share what would have been a, um, a grant and, and perhaps hire somebody to help coordinate efforts to improve services and reduce costs. That would be a, a, a second choice. First choice is to get a grant. But I think people are believing there's a lot of promise here. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, I, I've been meeting in the last month or so with all of our administrators, just kind of a check-in on their goals for the year. Just like teachers, they sit down and <clears throat> meet with me in, in the fall to talk about things that they want to kind of pursue for either their school or for themselves. And we just are sitting down right now just saying, well, how's that going? And um, having conversations. I'll be writing evaluations for the administrators uh, later in April. So um, the last thing I think I want to say about evaluation in the last thing I'm going to say period tonight is, I, I, I must say, I, again, I've only been here two years, but I, I have um, continued to have reservation about the, the demands that are placed on teachers and administrators in the current plan that has been approved by you and the State Board of Education. The thing that I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really wondering about is the requirement that if you're a probationary teacher, <coughs> you'll receive a minimum of 10 formal evaluations each year um, with right up, you know, with, 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 with between, after each of those, a, um, a conversation and, and, and feedback, which I think is always deserved and appreciated. But then, so you have, you have 10 a year for people in their first, second, and third year. And then you've got 20 for teachers on continuing contract, which are the majority of your teachers over a period of, I think it's three years. And I just don't think it's, it, it's happening. And I'm not blaming anybody. But I, I think that I want to point out that I, I uh, and I'm going to be talking about this and I look forward to hearing about it from building level administrators and teachers. We have a, a, a standing committee um, and, and Kathy Stankard um, is on that from central office. And I, I, I'm not going to be surprised if next year sometime there may be I would request to come back to you as a board and look at what might be a more achievable number. I mean, the, the problem that I see with this current number of 10 every year and 20 every three is that if teachers are, teachers should, should expect that we are going to deliver on what we, what we commit to. And so there's a real letdown for them when they aren't seeing the number of visits that they believe we've um, signed up for. So that's not good because they're feeling let down and disappointed and I don't know, how, but it's not good. For the principals, it's not good and the assistant principals because they're feeling as if they're letting people down and they don't want to, they don't want to underachieve and they don't want to let anybody feel they're getting what, they're, what they deserve because um, it's, it's in writing, but I, I, I sense this tension here that's not good. And so I think that I would rather, I forget how it goes, but undercommit and overperform than the opposite. And I feel we've got the opposite. And um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Just know that I, I, I think it really, really deserves um, I mean, it's one thing if it was just an anomaly, you know, like, oh, I don't know, it was a certain year or, you know, I don't know what, I'm not seeing that. I, 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 um, I think that it's, I think that we've gotten a bit overly ambitious with, with this and I think it's all well intended. I mean, we should, we, we've got to change um, the, the norm in schools where principals really do have more time and find time to be engaging with teachers in classrooms and talking with students. I mean, it's, it's really possible to be very, very busy doing a lot of other things and not do that, and that's the wrong direction. But if you 
are committed to something and every year you're letting people down because you're so much going on, I just don't think it's right. So, okay, so you got it. Mm -hmm. So, please be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, am, 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 may I do this next thing? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you want to do it here. The next thing under here is a bullet about a proposed uh, Department of Ed waiver for student days. But further on in your agenda, it's also down under item E for um, action for new business. Do we want to do it then? Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll do it there. Okay, thank you. So moving on to Bless you. Uh, 6A, and I have a motion. I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth Education Association's request to form an ad hoc committee to study teacher planning time. Second. Any discussion? Uh, bless you. God bless you. <laughs> this arises um, really around, I'm, I'm going to say, particularly difficulty at Pond Cove. And um, we had uh, talked about it possibly going into policy, and it didn't feel like it, it really belonged in policy. And so now. Um, Teachers and board members um, are going to get together and talk about how to make sure that um, the the history and the lessons that we have learned aren't forgotten um, and, and are sort of um, kind of memorialized in the appropriate way. So um, uh, that's kind of the background around that. I don't know if Howard, you want to add anything? All I want to add is that I think that we all agree that as, to the degree possible, we want to provide teachers in all three buildings a relatively equal amount of playing time. They've all got different jobs, but they all, we, we understand and we agree that um, it, it, a noticeable imbalance is not desirable. What is desirable is for a relatively equal amount of time to do all the important work that they want to do. So, oh, sorry, um, oh my gosh. Sorry. What's the end point for the committee? Since an ad hoc committee, does it have a... I think the end point is that they, they would come back to you with a recommendation of um, a letter of intent or a letter of agreement with respect to planning time going forward. Correct? That's my understanding. And my apologies to the chair <laughs> for acknowledging. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right. When, oh. is, when also was a part of this, I don't know if there was anything that he wanted to add. Um, no, I don't know. If you recall, it was the only one. You looked like you were dying to speak. <laughs> Um, uh, this was a, a, a agreed in, in the contract. There was a side letter that, uh, that uh, was in the contract last year uh, that said that this would be addressed as a uh, possible policy. Um, in thinking about it, we didn't think, uh, we agreed that that wasn't probably the best route to take. Um, and we're just hoping that, you know, this has been an issue at Pond Cove in particular. And so they've been struggling with having planning time. They have it this year. And, um, and it's been, uh, it's really paid off uh, in their work. And uh, the, the key is that it continues. So we were just looking, we had drafted a letter of intent um, that to be looked at by this committee um, and hope that going forward, the association and the school board can agree to this letter so that um, so that, that kind of thing, that the planning time at Pond Cove can continue. Any other questions? Yeah. Go now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, may. Oh, no, no, yeah, I was about to say yeah. that. Yeah. May I have a vote? All those in favor? Okay. Um, next is. Um, it's not a 
considerations of, for the following administrative procedure policy for first reading. So I'm going to let um, Elizabeth address that. So for the last two policy committee meetings, we have been talking um, in particular with the principals about um, the administrative procedures for transferring and hiring personnel, which really um, bubbled to the surface because it, it became apparent that there were um, kind of different traditions being used at different at, at each of the buildings when it came to hiring and it was it could be confusing to some people and this this goes back into the summer i believe if i'm not mistaken it, it's it's not happening now but bubbled up over the summer so um we had everybody in the room together talking about um the you know appropriate steps to take you know um, advertising you know within the, the school department first and then how many days and then um, publicly advertising for X number of days and that sort of thing um, just making sure that kind of everybody is on the same page and we'll be um, running those kind of searches the same way so people people feel that they've had you know a, a fair crack at something um, so we worked that out, and um, the language around vacancies and transfers that you will see in this policy is taken straight from the teacher's contract. So everybody here needs to remember if this ever gets changed that we need to change this policy too. Um, and uh, we, I mean, we did some cleanup of, of language, but mostly it was around making sure there was consistency. Thank you for that. All right, moving on to item 6C. May I have a motion? I move that we consider um, an action to approve the following 2017-18 athletic personnel nominations. Shane Knowles, baseball 8th grade. Matt Whaley, softball 8th grade. Per Norius, outdoor track. Jane Redberg, lacrosse girls, eighth grade. Christopher Drake, lacrosse boys, seventh. Jake Haugavik, I apologize if that's wrong. Lacrosse boys, eighth. Taylor Candidge, baseball, seventh grade. And then at the high school level, Russell Thompson, lacrosse boys, JV. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Next, item 6D, may I have a motion? I move we approve the Can We project trip to Camp Sunshine in Casco, Maine, March 16 through 18, 2018. Second. Second. Any discussion? It's tomorrow, right? That sounds like it's tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> We leave at 8 a.m. I was going to say, can someone tell us what that's about? Yeah, can you maybe explain it? Yeah. Um, so I sort of touched base on it a little bit, but it was a little confusing. So um, basically a group of 25 students um, from six, six different schools. Um, it's a program sponsored by Wayne Fleet. Um, oh, okay. And we're going up to Camp Sunshine. They've generously donated the, the facility. Um, and we are going to be having dialogue mainly focused around um, partisanship um, and the political divide that um, is sort of plaguing our nation right now and hoping that we can, as young people, reach some solutions um, and get those conversations going. Brilliant. Awesome. You, do, you did it. Somehow I didn't connect with I didn't, yeah, I didn't connect with so. <laughs> No worries. Uh, all those in favor? Next, 6E, may I have a motion? I move we authorize the superintendent of schools to pursue a waiver from the DOE to reduce the required number of student school days for the 2017-2018 school year. A second. A second. Any discussion? Yes. yes. So, um, where do I start? Well, here's some facts. Um, we are required by state statute to offer a minimum of 175 days of instruction. Um, that would be for students 
uh, kindergarten through 11th grade. And then for seniors, we're required to offer a minimum of um, 170 days. We this year have lost nine days to date um, for a variety of reasons. We kind of plan in a calendar, though it's never more than just you know, a, a target, for up to five days of, um, of cancellation during a year and hope that we don't ever get near that. But that's kind of what we tend to use. We, Mr. Shedd picked um, the first su Sunday, Sunday or Saturday, graduation? Sunday. Sunday. Picked the first Sunday after what would have been the 170 days plus the five cancellations. That happens to be, I think, the 10th of June. Right now, the seniors must make up at least five days to get to the, right? Must pick, must pick up at least five days in order, in order to um, meet the requirement, the minimum requirement of um, 170 days. That puts their last day on that Friday of, of that week. Mm -hmm. And um, we <clears throat> already have um, plans for retirement, uh, for, for graduation on, um, on the, the 10th, and we plan to honor that. Um, we have people planning to fly here, to travel here, to be with their families and celebrate. We have pieces of you know, reserved, and we, we need to make that work, right? So the question is, how do we, how do we do that? And there are at least two ways to accomplish that. One way is to have something in place just for seniors. And another would be something for everybody, K-12. And there's, I think, logic, if it's possible, you wanted to solve it all uh, together. It's less confusing for families and for transportation and staffing and a lot of reasons why you want to just stick it together, I think, keep it together. So right now, by the way, the last day for, for students K-11 is the 22nd of June. Any more cancellations, and we're into the very last week of June. It's pretty unheard of. Um, and I, I, I received a very thoughtful email today from one mother. I, sh I shared it with you. And one of her points, which I think is very persuasive, is that I really want my kids to not lose out. I mean, a lost day is a lost day. And I get that point, and I think that the administration and teachers also get that point. But what is the difference between getting in a day and getting in a quality day? And I, 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 I've never been a fan of trying to figure out ways to, to kind of package it together to get a day. I mean, you know, I, a day ought to be where it's relaxing, it's the, it's the normal experience. You can really be there to learn and teach. And, um, you know, I, I just, so I'm concerned that we don't do something that just to be clever, to, to, to capture minutes or days, and, and I feel that that somehow is better than uh, other alternatives. One alternative that, that I personally think, um, or I am recommending to you, and, and please do with it as you wish, you could say no thank you, or you could modify it, or, or approve it, but I recommend <clears throat> um, we're requesting five days. I've never asked that for. I've asked before for one and two, but I never asked for five. Um, but I think that this year has got a lot of unusual circumstances. We've had um, power outages over a long period of time. Beginning in October, we had some power outages. We had one recently. We've had a lot of snow days. We've had a cancellation over safety concerns. Um, 
I mean, it's just been a whole lot of things added up to get to this number nine. And um, I, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to some degree about ideas with um, Jeff Shedd. I shared with you, by the way, in your packet, some ideas that he has for a combination of some Saturdays, half days, and maybe some one hour after school. But there are so many other ideas that have come up. I've also had a chance to speak with, with Lynn Phillips um, and Lisa uh, Melanson. And you know, we, we thought of a number of things. I mean, one idea is that you, if you look at the April break, there's a Friday the 13th before the break starts. One idea would be to have you change the calendar and count that, call it a, a, an instructional day. Do you see that? The 13th of April, that's one, that's one of many ideas. Another one would be to take days out of the April vacation, right? Another one would be um, to add days to the end of the year. Some of them, all of them, just keep pushing the year, but have it maybe be something less than the 22nd. Another one, as has been pointed out, would be to um, add minutes or hours to the end of the day. One teacher today sent an interesting proposal to Mr. Shedd, which was, you know, even if we were to take a few minutes at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, it wouldn't be that noticed, it wouldn't be that big a deal, but they all add up. And with the number of days we have left in the year, maybe an additional 10 minutes a day would equal so many days. And it could be of some benefit. I mean, I, I think that for some children, adding an hour is, is, is a lot more than you realize. First of all, it's exhausting. A lot of kids and students have after school programs. They have after school jobs. Do those get pushed back? We have um, really teachers with young children. What do they do for childcare? Because they're planning on getting their children at a certain time that pushes that out an hour later to so cost them more money if they can even get the child care. I mean, there's, there are, are, I can't think of any simple solutions to any of this. And if we have Saturday uh, school, we're gonna have families that are gonna be away. We're gonna have teachers that are gonna be away. But on vacation periods, including the 13th of April, we have people who already got plane tickets, bought and ready to go. We have teachers that are ready to go. I mean, we, if we do some of these things, we have to be patient and tolerant and, and say, if you can't be here, the world doesn't end. If you can't be here, we'd appreciate it. And those of us who are here, we'll do what we can. But it, don't ever think it's gonna be the same as the days we lost, it won't be. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a day. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if, if we were to request five days and they were to be approved, assuming we had no more cancellations, the seniors would be, would be on. I believe there aren't, that, that solves their problem. And everybody else, they, they, the other students then would move up a week to the 15th. That would, would, would I think, be dis, uh, quite ideal. If we had more days that are canceled, I mean, some people are already talking about another Nor'easter coming in next week. I don't know. But I almost think that for the seniors right now, they need to, if we have to have more days for them, we figure out a Saturday just for seniors and, and, and do something for those that can make it and not worry about everybody else and have something that every, the, the students and teachers and principal can feel is a, is a acceptable solution for them and just count on the fact that they'll, they'll do their best. Um, the administration is working with the Teachers Association on <clears throat> developing some kind of a survey to ask our teachers, well, what do you guys think? I mean, if, if all these ideas, if you had to pick one of them, what would it be? Do you have other ideas that we haven't thought about? But we're, we're, we're trying to keep exploring what could be a, a education, an educated response. But as Mr. Shedd pointed out, we don't have a lot of time here to figure it out. And in March is maybe the best month to pull off a Saturday if you're gonna do that at all because it's before spring season and it's March. 
Nobody likes March. Uh, Except for the skiers right now. Pardon me? Except for the skiers. Except right for the now. skiers, yeah. Um, so, anyway, just know that we're looking, and 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 you've got a you've got some meetings coming up that are budget meetings between now and and the third or the tenth of April. If we come up with an idea that we think ought to be brought to you and require your correction and adjustment to this calendar, we might just add that with your permission to one of the budget meetings, call for a special, a special board meeting just for the purpose of adjusting the calendar. If we, if we think there's something here that just makes sense, that would give us a little bit of latitude. Um, so here we are. I'm just, I, I don't know if others in the room have got more to add to that, but we want to, I, 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 I think that um, if you support the idea of a waiver, I'd like to know that, and I'd like to know how many days you would want me to request. Okay, Elizabeth? Um, so during the last, uh, this past snowstorm, there was a lot of uh, media attention paid to the, the, the last blizzard of this magnitude, which was in 1993, which happened to be my senior year in high school, and which, at which point all the schools had to apply for waivers in order for the seniors to graduate. So there is precedence right. for this to happen, and I was glad because I wanted to graduate on time. <laughs> um, and I take all of this very seriously. I believe the board, the administration, the teachers take all of this very seriously. Um, and just in kind of passing joking, dropping off my, one of my children at school one day, I happened to chat with a middle school teacher and, and this, none of this was on the agenda. It was very social, sort of like, oh gosh, we, you know, we're going so late and oh, you know, why don't we just add 10 minutes onto the end of the day for the next, because it would take like 60 days or something. It would take a really long time to make up days by doing that 10 minute thing. And the teacher just looked at me and said, what kind of quality do you think that would be? And I said, I think it would be a joke. I don't think it would actually do any good. But if we're, I mean, it's kind of, we have to think about what the point of it is. Is the, you know, is if quality matters, then we have to be aware. Um, you know, that, that one hour, when I first read this packet, I felt it was very much targeted towards seniors, with good reason, because I think there's concern around that graduation date. But I can't see having a kindergartner go an hour longer without a snack and a nap and a, and a like, I, <laughs> You know, I can't see my fifth grader going an hour longer and then going straight to the, the middle school musical rehearsals, which are going on right now. Um, the, you know, the, we're, we're kind of in between seasons for high school, but we're in the middle of the second spring season at middle school because they get that extra, like, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So like, I think it, it poses lots of difficulty, but I think the number one even if we're not thinking about jobs and plays and sports and things, is quality. Yeah. Are we just saying, okay, we're grinding it out and it doesn't matter because we just need to get it done? And knowing that, you know, if if we do this April vacation idea, that you know we're going to not look at the attendance data because it would be horrible and the quality would be poor. We look at the Saturdays. I think we would get a similar. Right. So. Um, I'm personally in favor of requesting the five waiver days. John? So I think you hit a couple of points, one of which is a quick question. What's the turnaround time on a waiver? I actually think we, we have very little time to make this decision, and the sooner we make it, because everybody's planning on all of these schedules. The, the letter would go out tomorrow, mm -hmm. and I would hope to have an answer within a couple of weeks. It, it won't be overnight. I mean, I, I, I think that the commissioner, um, I mean, I, can, I could call and ask him to be paying attention to this, um, but you can imagine other school districts are having some of the same similar thoughts. And um, normally when I made this request, I've heard back within a couple of weeks. Yeah. I think the timing and the turnaround is critical. Because yeah, by, by, by the time we hear back, we're not we're going to have even less room to operate. That's right. Mm -hmm. So 
what, what, what I would suggest is that we request five, and if not five, then four, and we can figure out, um, you know, whether it's that additional Friday and the April vacation day, or is like try to make it look as best as possible. But I, I also want to echo exactly what Elizabeth said about quality. Right. Um, it, you know, I'm really not interested. I don't think it benefits anybody to go through a charade right. of the education. I mean. You have folks here on AP exams in May. Right. They're not moving, and we're not going to get that time in before then for a lot of these people. <clears throat> but, you know, the, the school I went to prided itself on its academic academics, <clears throat> but yet, because of the rules, there was a fellow in my a year ahead of me who has found out in his last month he's a sh credit short of graduate. So they figured out a way within the rules that you could register for a single class. It was a non-academic, one-credit class it was for athletics. And all the other athletic ones had begun, but bowling didn't matter. Bowling, it was only how many games you bowled. Okay? So in, in April, here's a guy bowling games on three lanes for his one credit to graduate. And I'm suggesting that we do not want all our students to spend their time bowling like this guy did. This is a charade. And so we want, if we're going to do it, we want to figure out how we can get quality days. Um, just as a senior, I think it would definitely be most effective to try and work in any time that we can before AP tests because like Allison and I have been thinking, um, we just have missed so much time and especially for seniors having to I mean, I don't really understand when when seniors would make up time, but we have STP, and then, so STP is the last two weeks in May, and that's um, the 22nd to the 28th, something, it's those, mm -hmm. it's, we have the Sexual Assault Awareness Day, and then, right, thanks, Allison. Um, it's June. Yeah. So, the 21st and the 28th are the two Mondays and we go Tuesday to Friday. Um, and I just don't see being there being a point for seniors. I just think the quality would be so much greater if it was done, if the days were made up in March and April than if they were in May. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I I agree with that, and like obviously not all students are AP students, so it would be differ um, for each student. But yeah, yeah. But um, the fact that these days aren't moving and that we have to get like X amount of content in before these days, I think would drive these students to work harder. If we were to say go for a Saturday, and the quality would be a little bit more there than it would be if we were to do it after, um, like noted in the original plan. And I think so students nice would plan. definitely, sorry, rather go for a Saturday than, I, I personally could not do an extra hour after school. <laughs> I just, in com being completely serious, I just don't think many students could could do that. I think people would rather go on a Saturday. So may speak to that. Yes, please. So you've both been very clear. Thank you. Um, I mean, my impression is that we will hear back shortly. I mean, this letter would, would go out tomorrow if you approve this. And, and um, I would contact him maybe about a week out and say, you know, I'm looking forward to a response. Um, but if, if, it is, if it's turned down or modified, I would know pretty quickly. I would hope by the end of this month. And, and, and then Mr. Shedd would work with seniors and with his teachers, and they would figure out what we're doing, I think just for seniors. I mean, I think we could figure out everything else. I mean, it, it's really the seniors that we're most <clears throat> concerned about. But we'll, you'll figure it out. And then if we need to, we'd come back with a recommendation to adjust the calendar. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, <clears throat> just to weigh in. Um, one question I have off the bat is, this, is this impacted at all by PAS? Like, we're not tied to the fact that, you know, we normally have to have no less than five dissimilar days. There's, that's no, not no, going to no. be, that's not no. going to be a complication. They've been closed every day. We've been closed, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no, I figured. But, <laughs> yeah. so, um, my feeling is that you should definitely ask for the five days, um, hope that we get them. But I also, I also think that 
we should highly consider adding two days, either whether it's that Friday of, of break or, or Saturday um, or two Saturdays, because I think I, I, I agree that it has to be quality time, but if we approach it with a different perspective, like if we approach it with like, okay, these aren't gonna be, a, it's not gonna be a typical school day. Let's make it something different. Let's make it something better. Let's use it as an opportunity. Some people will use it for AP, you know, some people can use it for other reasons. But I think about the, the mom who wrote a letter and we, we do owe an education and um, two extra days, even if we get the five days, is, is better than, you right. know, if planned well, um, and approached with the right kind of attitude, it could, they could be great two days. Right. So that's what I'd like to recommend. Kimberly? Could I, I, I second that I, in a way? Um, I, I totally appreciated um, the letter that we got today, and I'm very much on the same page. Um, and I, I guess in an ideal world, I would like to just carry through and, and finish whenever we've made up all the days that we've missed. I recognize that with seniors that's not feasible. Um, and, I, and I hear and, and value that for the seniors in particular, perhaps having time before the end of the school year, or before May even, to, is, so is there a scenario where seniors could go on a Saturday and have the rest of the school, I mean, we can have some waivers, but I, I am in favor of making up as many days as we can. So have the rest of the school carry on and have just regular school days where their schedule is as they're used to. And So I, 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 I believe I understand what you're saying. And so what I would, would like to do would be, if you agree to the waiver, let that go forward and then let me work with the administration and teachers and students and come back soon with a way that we could capture you know, being, being back a couple of either half days. But I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'll look forward to hearing what teachers say on the survey that, we, that we're trying to send out about the one hour after. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be as um, popular as some half days. Mm -hmm. So let, 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 I mean, we need to talk about this, but I think what you're saying is, let's try, try and do what we can to get some level of quality um, for some kind of some kind of makeup here for a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think <coughs> I think some makeup days is worth worth it. Okay. Elizabeth. Heather. Heather. Uh, I have a question, sort of following up on what. John was saying a little bit earlier, if you, uh, I'm asking about process, if you send in a letter uh, to the state, to the commissioner asking for five days, um, and he sends it back to you, is there a way to then ask for four or three or whatever, and just, or will he, will that come, that response come as, well, I can't give you five, but I can give you four? How does that work? I mean, is it an all or none, we ask for five or that's it? Well, I, I've asked or, for a certain number several times, and they've always been approved of that number. But okay. I've never asked for five days. Right. I've asked for, I think the most I've ever asked for was, was two. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess my question being is if we get rejected for five, I'll take two <laughs> if we can get two. And well, do you I, have I an think, idea of how that would happen? Yeah, would well, you have to reapply? Yeah, I think we would. Okay. Yeah. And we would say that um, we are doing our best to bring back some days in a creative way, and here's what we're doing, and we're asking you now, we could change okay. the number to something less than five. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth? So I had a couple of questions, and the first is, um, and you may or may not know this, but if you request five and you're granted five, is it that we may use up to five wave days, which means we, we, we could just wave all five? Or um, maybe we only need to waive three because we're building two back in. Do you know? Do we have right. that? Does yes. asking for five give us flexibility? Is right. You're required to use all five. You can take, use the ones you want. Which, so I'm very much in favor of you asking for five and giving us that flexibility, either to use all of them, use three of them, use not whatever. Mm -hmm. My second question is. Um, 
Is there a sense of at least two being granted because there was a state of emergency declared in October? Well, Typically, I, I, I've, state you, of emergency does If you look at this article of the day in the um, Portland, um, was it Press Herald? Yeah, there's a front page article about snow days. Mm -hmm. And they quote in there someone from the Department of Education. I don't know if you saw the article or not. I but I, I thought what she was saying is that um, those don't count. It, it, I, I just scratched my head. I, I don't understand that. But it's typically state of emergency does come into play. Right, it does. Just interesting. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say we, we asked for five, but the, the teachers, administrators work together. So let's let's find a, a couple of creative ways to add some school days, okay. even if we get five. Okay, I get it. Yeah. <clears throat> I, would, I would echo that. I would, I would look for, definitely for it at that Friday before the April break, because that can look, I think, most like a school day. Mm -hmm. But I, I think right now, even with five, we're operating with no margin. Right. That's right. And, right. And, and, you know, it's a long, it's still a long period with no margin. So I would say start planning now to figure out, can we add in right. so at sure. least two more days somewhere and ask for five? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. Ready to vote? All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. All right, now mo moving on to committee reports. We'll keep it brief just because we're moving into budget after this. I know, Kimberly, you're leaving in about a minute, so. Um, do you have any committee reports that you want to go first or no? Okay. Elizabeth? Policy. Um, I attended a policy luncheon given by Drummond and Woodsum. Um, there were uh, several superintendents and policy chairs in attendance and really it was, um, you know, what, what was on school districts' minds, what, what kind of policies were bubbling to the surface. Um, there was a lot of discussion about how different school districts were handling um, the walkout. This was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the safety concerns and the concern around um, teachers and you know whether or not they're on the clock, all, the, all those different concerns. Um, a couple of different um, school departments have not done a policy manual review in a really long time. So it made me feel proud because we're really on the ball with that, so it, um, there were a lot of questions about how do we how do we do policy review, how do we do this. Um, I would say that it was a very useful um, and productive luncheon, and I would recommend um, going forward that um, the chair or policy chair, especially, attend. They're going to give these quarterly, and um, they just kind of tell you what's coming down the pike or what's inter you know what's bubbling up in other districts around you. Um, upcoming in policy committee for Cape Elizabeth. We're going to be reviewing the homework policy. Um, the nurses um, and the policy committee will be reviewing concussion and head injuries. Um, we'll be looking at religious, holi uh, religious holiday policy. We're not going to be um, looking at religious holidays and, and making different determinations. Um, we're going to be talking about um, making a commitment to um, showing nutritional info for our school lunches for everybody, and um, I think that's that's pretty close to what's coming up. Thank you. Hope? Um, from the past committee, um, this morning was their general advisory committee meeting, and um, they had some updates. Uh, regarding the recruitment efforts from Cape Elizabeth, there have been 25 students who visited paths, prospective students who would be interested in the program, and six um, upcoming plan visits from our students. Um, in the last month, the students have past participated in two different competitions that are both state and nationwide. One is the Skills USA uh, Championship, um, where past students placed in either first or other, um, first or second in automotive, uh, culinary arts, medical, terminology, early childhood. So they're doing really well statewide. And a couple, um, and then, the culinary arts students participated in a, um, the Maine Restaurant Association's Pro Start Invitational, which is a culinary competition. There are five teams statewide, and the past team co competed. And the winner of that competition goes to a nationwide competition. Uh, unfortunately, the past team didn't, didn't make that. Um, uh, and they're adding a program uh, next year for cybersecurity. 
That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. John, anything on your list? Finance. Okay. All right. Heather, no. Um, I'm just going to plug this again. The, the Town Comprehensive Planning Committee has not met uh, February or March just because each night has been snowed out. Um, we're going to make up a date hopefully on the 22nd of March at 7 p.m. here. But my plug is, uh, especially to school board members and anybody who's watching, but please participate in the online forum on Lumio and, and don't feel, because you are school board members, that you can't put your opinions and voices you are also you know, community members, and we need to hear from, from everybody as much as possible. Um, it, it, we've hit, a, we've hit a, a flat number, no more people are joining, and it seems to be the same people who are the only ones voicing. So we need a wide perspective, and I really am encouraging my fellow school board members to get online and, and participate. It's really important. Yep. Um, I have joined that online forum, and I participated only twice, and in the second conversation was around, um, you know, opportunities for, um, you know, raising the, the fiscal profile or raising funds in the town. And um, I, I didn't identify myself as a school board member, but did talk about talk about needing to explore ways to raise revenue for the town, and specifically in support of the schools. And what I want to share is that the moderator said that um, those comments would be better directed to the school board and that there was a school board member on the committee. So I felt like, I, I, I don't know that that moderator was really open to hearing. So that is a, that's a point that I would like to bring back to you as our representative that yeah. it kind of turned me off from being a part of the conversation. That's too bad. Yeah. Keep, keep at it. And, and um, I'm not sure who the moderator was. It's just another member of the committee. Mm -hmm. No one's trained as moderators, so mistakes, you know, will be yeah. made for sure. Um, but especially when they're talking about the, the subject of, you know, raising revenue with, within the town for certain projects, you know, this is where I want to speak up. And so, thank you for, for joining, and don't don't back off. Don't take it personally. So, um, that's it. Okay. Um, announcement of upcoming meetings. Let's see, we have, um, so the town comp is on the 22nd, we have, um, John, I'll let you go through the budget meetings if you want to, if you have them on the, in front of you, if not, I think I, because I think I have them in my head, <laughs> so maybe you can verify. So the next one is next Tuesday, the 20th, um, and then we have one on the 27th, and then one on the 3rd. Exactly. Um, tonight we're going to talk about scheduling some additional meetings, not necessarily workshops, but may, might be one workshop and then another one might be a, a public forum, which has not been set yet. But I think those are the, um, the next three meetings that are definitely budget related. Any other meetings that people want to um, bring up? Policy committee is scheduled for Monday, March 26, although we haven't all gotten together on a time as far as I know. so. We'll be working on that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, then I have a motion for number 10. I move we adjourn to a budget workshop. I have a second. I second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? We're gonna just a short break in between. Yep, we're gonna take a short break in between. <laughs>
Are you ready, John? 1993. Um, yes. I actually okay. uh, was superintendent on MBI that year. I never made any labor. It was a big okay. deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. We had to get like four days. Yeah. We're on air, so we're gonna get we're gonna get back um, together and move on to a budget workshop. Um, this is our fourth fourth budget workshop, um, and it is Thursday, March 15th. I'm going to hand it over to John Bolts and just do you want to introduce the evening or I'm sorry, what? you want to introduce the agenda? Sure. So just briefly what we're going to be covering tonight is um, I'm going to get a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we've previously talked about, in particular a recap of some of what Rebecca Miller talked about last time that I think is really important. Then we're going to go through, Catherine Messmer is going to go through some uh, detail on both some questions and some, some funding some funding items, and then we're also going to go through what's in the budget binder and uh, um, a number of programs that were proposed but are not actually in the budget. So I, when I look at editing any document, the first the first pass through, I think one of the things that you need to do before you can really start to, to edit in earnest is to make sure you've clarified what's unclear and what's missing. So. We've tried to answer any questions, explain in detail what is in the budget, anything that's unclear to people, we uh, encourage your questions. And this uh, program review tonight of what's not in the budget is, is, is sort of asking that question to bring it to the board level to consider, well, is anything really missing from this budget? Um, and, uh, how, how are the architectural pieces in there as well? It is. Okay. Um, so, those are the sort of three portions that we're going to cover in tonight's uh, budget workshop. So let me briefly um, urge people who are interested. The budget workshops are all uh, available on video on, on, online at the, at the budget site. The budget materials are also there. Um, <clears throat> we went through in specifically how we staff our schools, how the, the, the population of our schools uh, has been uh, pretty much exactly flat, plus or minus five students at 1,600 over the last three years, which is quite flat. Uh, our, our head counts this year are looking pretty much exactly flat. Our, our non-personnel costs are um, pretty much exactly flat. I think they're up or down a few thousand dollars. And I, I, don't, I don't recall. I think it was up 80,000 or down 80,000? Uh, up. Up eighty thousand on about a, so it's on about through a couple four four million dollar total. I believe so. Yeah, it's around that. It's around th um, so, and percentage trims is less than um, it's far less it's like point two percent or something like that. I think of the non personnel cost. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so one of the things we were lucky enough to have Rebecca Millett come and explain a little bit about the current environment and the education funding and formula, because as many people are aware, uh, the subsidy that Cape uh, Elizabeth receives from the state has experienced the, for the third straight year, a substantial cut of almost $900,000. Last year was about $800,000. A year before that, it was about $700,000. So it's down about 62% over three years, while our student populations have been dead flat. Um, that causes challenges when you're doing your budgeting. So I just want people to understand how that actually works. One of the things that they did this year, and in fact I was reading in the Press, uh, Press Herald, the article about the South Portland school budget, and they were talking to the superintendent there, and one of the questions he got apparently was, well, why is your state funding down when they added money to education this year? And he says he wasn't really sure. Well, Rebecca Millen actually explained this really well, and I wanted to take a chance to revisit this because I'm not sure everyone quite understood it. In this year's budget negotiations in Augusta, they did, they added significantly more money to the total amount for education. So they added, let's say, this much. What they also did in the legislation around education was they changed the cost of what they would require education to be. So uh, you know, the number of teachers, the number of, of staff. And, so, but they changed the cost for all education by this much, while they increased education funding by this much. So the difference is going to be funded by localities. So even though they increased the total amount, 
They required everyone to spend more than they increased it. So what happens as a result of that is that difference now falls out in the required mill rate that's expected of localities. So everyone across the state saw the mill rate go up because the mill rate falls out of how do you pay for that difference in what's not funded. And then in Cape Elizabeth, because we're all lucky enough to have had our property values go up substantially, some jurisdictions that's certainly not true, that hits us twice. So that mill rate now applies to the valuation the state uses that it updates annually for what your required local contribution is. So here in Cape Elizabeth, we do a revaluation every year. Revaluations are net are revenue neutral. What it means is you get the property values marked to market and you adjust your property tax rate and it's revenue neutral. But it reflects then that you have the accurate values for property. Well, the state adjusts, does the revaluation in its school funding formula every single year. So um, when property values are rising fast, it looks like your tax rates are going up. But what's really happening is you're not actually ca <laughs> you're not capturing the ex what's expected to be paid on your now increased property values. So when you go through the calculation, there's all of the things that are in the EPS formula around teachers and ratios and all these things. It's in the form. It's called the ED. It's called the ED 279. 279. And it goes through each of the levels of funding that you are sort of expected to have under the essential programs and services. It sort of gives you a ratio, and this is sort of what they will fund. And then, at the end of that, it talks about what your local contribution is. So they sort of get you down to a total cost. And to the extent you spend more or less, you need to sort of spend a certain level to get to EPS. Or, and if you spend more than that, you're somewhat penalized, um, which m many people do because EPS does not represent best practices in many cases. Um, and it does not represent, uh, funding EPS does not represent things like a small comprehensive college preparatory high school, so you won't see funding in EPS for nearly the level of college uh, counselors and, and, and guidance and other things that we have or the breadth of programs that we have at Cape Elizabeth High School. So then it falls down to this is how much we think your education should cost. This is what we're expected local contribution should be. And then the number falls out of that. So there was a big increase this year in both the mill rate, which derived from that change in the legislation where they required more spending on education from local districts without funding all of it, and then increases in property valuations. The net result is we're now either at or close to being a minimum receiver in state funding. Uh, the, the, the somewhat silver lining in that is after we're through this process, um, state funding no longer has the ability to yank our budgeting around as it has <laughs> because there's nothing left to cut. Okay, so while our school budgets and pop student populations have been changing in a very narrow band between, you know, minus 1% and up 3 or 4% three or maximum ban. State funding has shot all over the place from up 20, down 40, in the last three years down significantly. And so um, as a result, even when you have an up year, it causes challenges. So it's sort of like we're depending on the state and they're not dependable. It's, so you always have to make up the difference. Sometimes it's like having a roommate that doesn't pay rent. Sometimes they pay rent, sometimes they don't. Well, you've got to stop depending on them. And after this year, we'll be at a point where it won't really matter. Um, however, we manage to get whatever decisions we make in terms of both you know, funding and what we spend and what we cocked and the rest of it. But we're at a level now with state funding that it, it shouldn't have the ability to affect our uh, budgeting and tax rates to nearly the same degree because there's, there's, there's really nothing much left to cut. There's approximately 800000 that they could cut. <laughs> approximately. <laughs> before, we, before we become a true minimum receiver, and we, that's what I'm showing on the okay. screen right now. And this now. is, and the minimum receiver is 40% of all special ed costs. Correct. And, and which takes us to? About 400000 
that's how much we would receive from the state based on this year's calculations. Yeah. So, um, I've been highlighting the areas right. of import. <laughs> if we were a true minimum receiver in this cell here, the amount would be zero. Um, we are still getting some money from the state, so, but because our um, uh, our state share is less than 10%, which is one of the calculations they have, mm -hmm. we are the state is technically counting us as a minimum receiver, but we are not a true minimum receiver at this point. We could still lose funds. <sighs> so, my last brief summary of, of uh, what, go, what happens in Augusta changes every year. You never, the two things that affect your funding are tweaks that they make to the state funding formula, and there's about 10 different knobs that you can turn. Um, how they turn those knobs is a rather opaque process. Uh, doesn't have, I'm aware, has, does not have a lot of participation. Sometimes it's done by the legislature, sometimes it's done by the Department of Education. Uh, and then there's the amount of money that goes into the top that sort of flows through the waterfall. Uh, and that also has been quite unpredictable. So uh, understanding what you'll get every year is uh, a challenge for every school district. Mm -hmm. And in, in the last three years for us, it's been a particular challenge. Because oh, yes. as fast as the state funding has been changing, our fundamentals have been very flat. My turn now? Your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, while we have the ED279 up, we've had some questions regarding it, so I figured I'd talk about that. This is section one that I'm showing. I know it's a little hard to see on the screen. I have it as big as I can get it and get everything on the screen. This section B um, talks about how many teachers, regular instruction teachers, this is not, has nothing to do with special education, this is just regular instruction. Um, as I said, it's a little hard to see, you can't see it there. But this shows you the calculation where the state feels that we should um, have 40 and a half teachers K through five, and that we should have 24.1 teachers, six through eight, and 96 point, um, and 32.2 teachers, nine through 12, which is a total of 96.8. Our actual FTE per the state is 116.8 teachers. And one of, uh, one of the uh, school board members requested that I do a sheet showing how our totals per area equal compared to the state. So that's what I'm handing out now. Thank you. And so I'm not going to go into de detail about that, but in the, your budget binder is the ED, a copy of the ED-279. And I'll just get the page number out. And I drop all my papers on the floor. <laughs> um, the ED-279 is um, under the handout tab of your budget binder, and it's page 39 is where it starts. So in your free time, your homework is to compare what our teaching teacher um, ratio is compared to what the ED-279 is. Um, another question that we had was um, a request to clarify gifted and talented funding. And that is section... Can I sure. project before we move on? Just sure. It's, now it's, I don't know how... The, I'll, I will admit I'm the person that asked for this information. And what I was getting at was... Um, so... We talked. We this number came up before the 116, and I know we have a, a general consensus that we want our high school to be world class, college prep, small classes, etc. But what I was curious about was we see that total number, but we don't see what's happening at Conco or the middle school. So I want to make sure everyone's being represented equally. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to. And I also asked for. Um, uh, average class size. We do data. have that also. So, and we don't need to see it right now, but what I wanted to bring to the board's attention and for discussion was our, you know, how are we doing in reference to the class size policy for the Pond Cove and the middle school, and are we in line and make sure, because I think that's part of our yep. part of our job, right, to, to look at those. And I think they've, they've been part of the packages in the budget process in the past, and 
several of us are, are bubble parents, so we know what's happening to that bubble grade that's that had mm -hmm. those challenging years where there were no teachers. So I want to make sure we that's something that we keep an eye on and it's kind of part of our, our overall review. So that's where that question came from. Yeah. And we'll take time to look at that. Thank okay, you. so that is, as Hope said, that's where that came from and you guys can, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either Howard or myself. And as I said, there was another question about gifted and talented funding um, from last meeting's meeting, which I couldn't make. And that is section three of the ED 279. Um, it's under other subsidizable costs. What they do for gifted and talented is they look at our most recent audited financials and they take either what we've spent for gifted and talented or what we've budgeted and they'll take the lower amount so um, we don't overspend what we budget for <laughs> gifted and talented that's just not a good thing to do so what they did is they took the figure that you see here and i'll highlight in yellow so it pops out a little bit more is our most recent expenditures from our latest audited financials, which were as of July 1st, uh, June 30th, 2017. So back then we spent $18,000. Um, and then what they do is they multiply it by an inflation adjustment. This year it's 1.3%. It used to be 1.5%, but they dropped that. So that's one little knob that John was talking about how they reduce how much they provide as they, adju they adjust these inflation adjustments. Um, and so they give, get us a figure, but, and that figure carries through and is added to the total adjusted oper operating allocation, which is then carried through to section four, and that's how much they think we should pay for education and then they take what they think our state valuation is. This is not local valuation, this is state valuation. There is a difference. Um, local valuation, if you went to the tax assessor, says we have 1.7 million in valuation. The state is showing that we have 1.8 million in valuation. Um, and then they multiply it by the mill rate, which is what they figure out because they need a certain amount of money. And you, this amount that they calculate by taking our valuation, mostly applying it by the mill rate, is how much we have to raise in local funds in order to get any subsidy from the state. So this year we have to raise 15.9 million based on this calculation. Um, and so what the, the difference is, is what the state subsidy is. So the difference this year is 800,000, but then the next page they go in and they adjust it because we're getting less than 10% from the state. They do give us 40% um, towards special ed. So that reduces the local contribution and increases the state contribution by approximately 400,000. So I did, that's just the base calculation, but then I'm gonna go back to Gifted and Talented um, and show you if we did spend 100,000 on Gifted and Talented, and I can just do it this way. Hopefully, uh, nope. Have to put that little equal sign in front. Um, if we do add 100,000 to that, it, it flows through, adds to the total allocation. It increases how much we can spend towards education by 100,000. It's, it's very clear at that point if everything stays the same, our mill um, expectation that we need to raise locally doesn't change. So technically, we just increase how much we're getting back from the, fe the state by 100,000. Um, so that's, uh, that's something I wanted to point out can, on that calculation. So then if you go to the next sheet, it should flow through and show how that change, that in fact impacts our state sh our share. Right. It's not. The state share is not a function, it's not imposed on us, it's a result of how much we spend in relation to what the state is giving us. And it's, but it's only, can change it. it's only certain areas though. Yeah, right. It's only those areas listed in other subsidizable costs. And the only one we really can 
um, have basically this, I guess to say, one-to-one -one ratio is gifted and talent because they actually take what we spent add an inflation modifier and add that to the calculation. All the other numbers under other subsidizable costs are the special ed allocation that is a total, is an EPS allocation, which is an EPS calculation, which is very involved. Um, they have recently added a special ed high cost out of district allocation. Um, and then there's a transportation operating allocation, which is another EPS calculation. So the only thing that we really have direct um, control over is how much we spend for gifted and talented. All the other calculations that they use um, go through a very much more involved um, allocation uh, calculation process. So this is one of the few areas that it actually works this way. Um, so that's I wanted just to point that out that in this situation. And another thing I want to warn people is it's two years before you get that money because they have to use they go by your last audited report. I'm talking June 2017 is that where that figure comes. We're in the middle of 2018. We're not next year, they'll be using 20, 2018 figures. So there is a delay before you even see that subsidy. That so. was going to be my question because there's no way that we have a full-time gifted and talented coordinator for $18,000. Yeah. It's not a current number, so. It's no, this is just the. It's what we have to use. But I think it would be confusing for the public to understand that we actually do have, and it probably is closer to 100,000 probably, given that we have a full-time gifted and talented coordinator. We, but we won't receive those funds. Not for another year. For another yeah. year. But, um, but at least we're working towards it. So I just, that was a question that was brought up last meeting and I wanted to talk about that part. That was so. me. Catherine, is a question? Sure. This staffing you have here, is this our current staffing? Yes. So how do we know, for example, like let's just take um, world language, how, how does that square with um, this EPS model? I mean, do, 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 can we show where we're either below or above? We're above EPS on every level. But do we know how much, I mean, oh, I, I just, I mean it might be nice sometimes to just be able to know, for example, just take classroom teachers, um, if, you know, how far we are above or below what they say, I mean, I, I don't. I can do that pretty quickly right yeah. here. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I just think for, yeah. it might be nice to know the, the, the difference between what their model is and what we staff. Um, for pre-K through five, we do not have a pre-K program, but um, for K through five, they recommend 40.5 teachers. We have, and I have I'm having to do a little addition in my head, we have 44.9 teachers, that's K through five. Six through eight, they rec the EPS recommends 24.1. Six through eight, we have 34.5. Um, and nine through 12, they recommend 32.2 teachers, we have 41.5. Um, but we do have a very highly respected um, very good school district. Oh, I understand that. I, I, I just think it'd be nice to show, <laughs> it'd be nice to show the, the, <laughs> the difference and be able to explain the difference. There's a, we ought to be able to say, I think, we have X number more teachers at, say, the high school, and here's what, we get, here's what we're, we're offering that's not even in that model. I just, mm -hmm. uh, it right, seems like. Reason I, yeah, I was bringing it up more of a, I wanted to give Pond Cove and the middle school right their fair focus on the, on the, you know, are we, are they getting the, the same, do they have the same classroom size are we within, within the classroom size policy? Um, and I, I have no reason to think that we weren't, but I think every season, every budget season, it should be something that we consider. Right, but if we're comparing against the EPS, it'd be nice to see it showing up here mm -hmm. and, the, and the difference, I mean, I, 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 I don't have it in front of me. Right, you right next to, to you. Have to, yeah, it'd be nice to see them in the same I will call. add them. Yeah. Thank you. Also, I don't know if I took your point correctly or not, Howard, but when you're talking about, for instance, world language in an elementary school, right. there's hardly anybody else that is doing the wonderful work that, that Cape Elizabeth uh, Pond Cove Elementary is doing with um, foreign right. language in the elementary school, which right. 
that's that's part of filtering up to, to why we have this outstanding. But it helps explain the budget that we can articulate. It, it <coughs> absolutely does. Right. Absolutely. Can I make one more point? Because this is, it, it's a good thing for us to be able to understand that. I think if everyone understands sort of how this table works, it, it's it's not a. Um, we're not going to look at this chart and say we're going to make it in sync with the EPS formula because it's this magic thing. It doesn't apply that way. But I think if everyone's cognizant of how the, the levers work, then yeah, right. when you're doing the budgeting and when we're talking about tough budget years, you know how do these decisions impact the end result here. So go down from the teacher. I, I love having this up here because we can finally like look at something visual. So if you go down from the teacher column, go down to say. Um, uh, ed, ed techs. Ed techs. Okay. okay. So can you hi hi highlight that row so we can I see can it? I highlight that row. Um, so we have seven, and it says we should have 8.8. .8. Because of that, the state is taking our expense and multiplying it by 1.26. So they're giving us a plot to say, good for you, Cape, you're under budget, which is not, you know, not where we want to be. But so that's how the that's how it, it impacts our total number that the state is saying we should be spending. And when we go over, and the teachers, they're saying, oh, we're going to ding you. You're going to get 0.83 for whatever you're, what you're spending. Okay, so I don't know why I feel like this is something we should all understand. And I would, I would just feel better if everyone in the district sort of had a basic understanding of this chart because it, it should impact decisions at some level. So uh, you can see where if we're way under, for example, library techs, we're making money on library techs. They're multiplying our cost by 6.4 because, and I'm saying we add library text, but understand that that's how it's working. Does anyone, I mean, am I, do I sound like a crazy person? I just, <laughs> you're enthusiastic. I just, I really, so no, I, really, really want us to understand this. And so, then I can say, we, you know, we understand this and we're doing it, you know, we're, we're making informed decisions. So I think it's helpful exactly the road that you're going down where you're looking at the percent of EPS, which is that they're saying, how close are you to the model that we fully fund? And then whether you're over or under, they make an adjustment accordingly. Oh, um, AC. Right. Yeah. And um, also, as we've talked about, and just want to make clear, inherent in those ratios is uh, um, their opinion as to what makes a good education. To the extent you disagree, you will not match those figures. Of course. And so, but you want to make it with your eyes wide open, knowing how it's affecting the, the numbers. Right, right. So I don't want us to just say, this is mediocrity, let's throw it out. I want to say, yes, it is. And in this category, we don't want, care what they say. We're going to do what we want. We want world-class education. Um, but I want us to all understand what each number means and what are decisions, how they impact the bottom line. And then going back to the gifted and talented, I, I wanted to, it, it's great for us to understand that that number does have a direct, it will change our reimbursement rate. We can improve our reimbursement rate by spending more on that program. And I, I, I agree with the point, we shouldn't spend the money just because we get money for it. But I think that's a very important point in terms of when we make the decision on whether or not to spend money on it. And it also suggests what the state's opinion on those programs are, which is we should fund an adequate program. It just, it is, it's one of those basic things, just like the special education budget, we should be funding an adequate program. So I'm gonna bring that up later if we come back to Gifted and Talented as to whether or not our program funding is, is ad adequate at its current level. So I'm sorry, enough to. That's okay. Um, from this point, uh, I was, uh, we have a little option. You can, we can either go and discuss the items that are um, priority items that are not in the budget, or I can go through the budget highlights document to answer any questions that you may have. And I'm, whatever the majority would like to do, we're kind of flexible here. I don't want to waste their time doing something that we don't need to do, so. I think it'd be helpful to run through a quick version, to quick run through the budget highlights, and then I'd like to talk to what's done in the budget. One sec. I, I just want to agree on an end point for yeah. tonight, just because we've got a yep. lot of people in the audience who need to drive yep. far. So, um, 9.15, I'm comfortable. Nine, I don't know what everybody thinks. 9.15, 9.30, is 9.30 too late? What? I agree with 9.15. Um, so, if 9.15 is our end point, um, 
John, I, I think one of our goals for tonight was to go through the list of what's yep. not on the budget, yes. not yeah. in the budget. So let's, I, let's do that first, I think, actually, because I want to make sure that we actually get that covered. I think the budget highlights, if you actually go through the tab, are relatively self-explanatory. And so we can circle back to that if we have time. So I'm going to just put it up on the screen so okay. um, people can uh, see what we're talking about. There we go. And so, do you want us to go through each item and have the rep administrative okay, Howard? <laughs> May I just suggest Perry is here. Yep. He's not always here. He, he made yep. a long drive to get yep. down here. I think we would have, I'd be sure he gets his Let's time get here. Yep. First. So maybe we ought to take your items first, Perry. Yep. Would you, would you mind coming up here, sir? Thank you. Yes. Where you put this page? All right. The, uh, what, I, what I'm looking for is uh, two custodians um, that would be on a second shift. And one would be scheduled for the Pond Cove Elementary and middle school buildings, uh, actual location to be determined. And the other one would be, uh, I would say the majority of their duties would be for the town on the pool side um, with a focus on the high school locker rooms. Th this is a position that would probably be more uh, in the later hours where we run into a problem with the uh, town buildings that close up late and uh, the pool I believe closes at 9.30. And right now we have a large portion of the school custodians try to hit those areas on nights where we have sporting events and things also. Everybody kind of tackles those areas and, and we're looking to kind of do away with that and having a custodian just for those areas versus everybody trying to congregate in that, in that space. Um, the main, and this, this was kind of a last minute decision and, and I'd like more time at another meeting. The maintenance mechanic position, I think I would like to withdraw from the list. Um, I have another focus that, like I said, I apologize for the late being this late in the game, it's something that I would like to talk to Howard and Catherine about first before coming to the board about it. And um, something that's been coming up in the past two weeks. And uh, finally today, I was just like, hmm, you know, maybe I better address this differently before I present it to the board. And um, so I would like to hold on the maintenance mechanic position and kind of restructure um, my staff a little bit and then come back with something that I think will be a little more efficient. So that's it. Is there any uh, questions? Uh, appreciate it. Uh, uh, can you just sort of speak briefly to the overall custodial staff? Because that has sort of come up before. We sort of looked at it last year. We sort of added a custodian. It wasn't exactly what we expected. So, so just briefly sort of talk to the sort of workload and where we're at and sort of how that's working. Yeah, it's... And that's and the context for these, this request. These and and we, we do have 16 custodians um, on night shift. That, that's the bulk of the staff, the bulk of the cleaning that gets done. We do have a custodian in each building during the days that basically handles emergencies, spills, uh, lunch duties and things like that, uh, unlocking doors and just helping the building uh, move throughout its day. The, the majority of the cleaning of all the buildings is the, the, the group of 16 custodians at night. They handle the three schools and five uh, town buildings with, with, with just those 16 people. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty large workload for what they do. Currently, we have two custodians out of that 16 that are on limited hours. Um, I believe one has a couple hours cut short in their weekly average, and the other one actually has an entire day off um, due to medical conditions. Um, so we're not even really running at full staff, and if somebody calls out sick or, or anything like that, we're really shorthanded, and that, that's what I was saying. That's where we come into the issue of trying to tackle um, town building and high school events 
kind of last minute at the end of the night uh, so everybody can get home without having to pay a substantial amount of overtime. Um, uh, that's where we stand now. It's the, 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 sta the staff is stressed and, it, and it's a little tough at times to keep the morale going, but uh, we're stretched in right now. This, this may be uh, a complicated answer that you can't give tonight, but so you say we have 16 um, staff servicing the school buildings and town buildings. Mm -hmm. how, how many are in our budget? How many do we cover? Actually, I can answer that. Okay. <laughs> Te technically, the amount that it shows as an expenditure is for um, 13 of them. Three of them are, are paid for by the town, and then the school department pays uh, for the 13. And my understanding is the schedules are that th it normally is three, three of them work do the town buildings, all five of them is my understanding, and then the rest do the school buildings. So we are, um, the town does pay us for those three staff, and if we do um, want to go forward with the custodian for the high school in the pool, I would recommend talking to the um, town, the council, to see if, how much they'd be willing to put to pay towards that position. So uh, it, it is an all a burden to the school department. Sure. May I ask a question? So of the three that are now paid by the town, yep. is one of those three the new one that we thought was going to be at the high school that's not at the high school? No, that, no. So we're paying that person? At this point, yes. Thank you. That, that was going to be my question, and this is not, um, I understand that we have different people in, in um, the director's position, but pulled out my budget binder from last year during the snow day because I had to get away from my kids, and <laughs> literally the exact same language was a, a custodian to work on the, the um, locker room area, and it said the pool. And I went back and looked online, and I raised my hand last year and said, are we paying for someone to, to clean the pool? And the person at the time said, no, this is for the high school. And I scratched it out in my budget binder and wrote the date down, and that is not what happened. And so I guess I just want to, I agree that if, also how weird is it that you're asking us if you can hire a custodian for the pool, there's A, and then, <laughs> Because really, I feel like the, the town should know and approve of that expenditure since it really shouldn't be coming out of our budget, not once but twice. And I'd love to know how we might address or fix or work with the, the, the custodian that we did hire that was allegedly for the high school. And, and I know this is a, it's a, it's a ball of Christmas lights. Yeah. to try to untangle. I get that. <laughs> yeah, both Perry and I don't want to go through what happened last year, so that's why we're trying to be transparent up front, and that's why we're suggesting that, or um, that we do talk to the town about um, having them pay for their equivalent portion for any high school pool custodians that are there. Their, the, their total number is calculated, calculated through the school budget, but the town pays us for the a certain number of staff. But I would think they would want to know if they're going to incur. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'd also like to just say that this, again, underscores, I think, the problem with joint services, like trying to mm -hmm. save costs between town and school. And I would, you know, love to see what's, what's the number of custodians we need to cover our school, dist our school buildings. And then have that number and have that not be um, diluted by town buildings, and then any additional ones be added by the town. Um, I, it, it, because in order to track how sufficient the number is, you need to know on a regular basis that they're just sticking to school buildings. Otherwise, if some years they're doing school buildings, some, doing, some years t town stuff, you can't really track, you know, is this the right number or not? And, and I could get you that information. Um, that would be too hard to I, yeah, I don't know how much I need. I just, I just, I mean, I'm pointing something out. A, a, I think a, a problem in the system. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so. maybe there's a way for you to do a tracking system for yourself. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a time card, but just a.
just figuring out how much time people are spending in any one building. Right. So, so if I if I recall some of the discussion, it, it's unfortunately uh, not as clean as we would like it because there are some school events and some town events that are essentially all hands on deck custodian wise, mm -hmm. and so there's some always going to be some blending, and that's to both the town and the school's advantage. I, I, I actually think that the, the, what, we, what we need more clearly is a full understanding of what the adequate town and school services are and what portion we're expected and agree on it we're expected to, to bear. Because... Um, I don't think, oh, I'm, I think I'm saying that. Um, but I said there, there are pieces that are, um, like I said, to our advantage when you have these sort of all hands on deck type of events where we, we, everyone's working on a town function or everyone's working on a school function and that's just how, the way, that's just the way we, we get it done. And that's like to, to everyone's advantage. Um, so I, I, I will echo, however, the frustration in so far as um, it feels like wherever they were added, that we actually added custodial staff and I don't know what metrics we're using in terms of what they're supposed to be doing, but and we're down a few hours. But it seems like we added staff and we're still short. So uh, understanding what metrics and, and, and how those are changing in terms of what they're supposed to be covering in the states that's supposed to be would would be helpful in describing what the need is. And and, and I understand this is you know school and town function. Um, it, it it's it's. Frustrating to find ourselves in this position again. Right. So. Right. Well, if I could add something. L last year when we were doing this, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure I remember correctly, I think the request was for two, high, two custodians at the high school. I don't think they were trying to add. So we did get the one, and it's not sufficient any way you look at it. Um, so that's what I remember. So we're just trying to get the other one that was requested last year, but we're finding that it even isn't enough and we need it at the Pine Cove and the middle school too. So that was just my recollection. Thank you, Barry. Thank you so much. So, let's see who else. Um, Jason, do you, want, do you want to address, is that right? Yep, he's on top. Do you want to address what's not on the budget? So that's the lunch recess aides, is that right? Um, yeah. Oh, and, the, and the learning strategist. Sure. So where should I start? Just with the strategist? Sure. So I'll start with that. And I, I did um, present this at the last meeting, but I'd like, I could potentially give a more comprehensive description. Uh, so um, this, the need for this position um, starts with a little bit of a backstory. So, um, when I came on board, um, I, I was um, glad to hear that I would have the support of the student support coordinator, the SSC position, which has been which is funded through special education. Um, but for this year, uh, that um, that position, a, a significant portion of that position, was slated to be used for the coordination of RTI, which is a regular ed initiative. Um, but we were receiving support through that, and so it was presented to me that it would be a one-year, um, a one-year support as we were really um, ramping up and actually, in some ways, beginning RTI at Pond Cove, um, and so that has happened and it has been successful. And so um, now, uh, the the person in that position is going to be, um, as I'm told, used for um, other special education purposes. And so um, it's really, it's refilling that, it's filling the void that that will leave. Um, so we have someone doing the job now. Um, and so that's why I'm requesting this. Yeah. So, so when you, you say it's been successful, can you give us some character and flavor to that so that we understand what we're sure what we may be losing out on here sure so what what that person in terms of RTI what that person does is um, runs uh, our student support team uh, which is um, a structure that we have um, where um, teachers bring um, case 
cases of students that they're struggling with and there are teams of, of professionals that support them and give them advice and, and possibly observe in the classroom, that type of thing. So that person is doing that. That person provides coordination and support over the RTI ed techs. That's another part of it as um, including the techs creates that need for that kind of structure and coordination to provide services. Um, so this individual is um, you know, supporting those techs, helping helping them um, interpret data, decide on focus for instruction, create helping create schedules for them. Um, so this person also um, works closely um, on on a student by student basis. As students are struggling, if if a student um, works its way through their way through the tiers of intervention and ultimately ends up in a special education referral. Um, this person follows that child, um, helping to coordinate and make sure that they receive all the interventions that they they are entitled to and that we we um, are obligated to provide um, up until that point. Uh, and then so this person also is plays a leadership role in the building um, around um, data analysis, instructional practices, interventions, goes to uh, grade level team meetings, talks to teachers about strategies, so there's a whole. So without this person, what will happen to the RTI program and its current impact? So it sounds to me like what you've described is the RTI program is meant to intervene at early stages for struggling learners to help them in areas of particular academic need, uh, in part aimed around bringing our t test scores uh, of those who are proficient up to where we want them to be. Right. And, and so if we're not going to have this person who's doing that coordination, um, what do we think the impact may be? Sure, so the impact would be um, a reduction in service directly to children because what we would need to do is probably look in-house, um, look at our RTI um, teachers, experts, and figure out how to have a portion of their position, their time spent doing this work. So it would, it would um, result in, in somewhat of a reduction to direct service in children, probably what it would, would do is a significant reduction in service to our older students. Uh, most likely we would prioritize the earliest intervention possible. So um, we would try to keep um, an emphasis on K1 and 2 and there would probably be a significant reduction in grades 3 and 4 for intervention services. That's what I have I mean, we, I would be working with my team to figure that out, but that's what I see in other schools that do not have. I, I understand you, that's not what you want to do, but I want to be clear, when you, when you don't spend dollars, that has impact, so we just want to understand what those are. I'm sorry, can you repeat I, that? I said, we understand that's not what you want to do, but we also understand when you don't spend dollars, it has impact, and we're just trying to make sure that we understand what that yes. is. It also sounds like it may have some impact in terms of the... Uh, level and depth of referrals that would go to special education because this is the person who's coordinating those uh, referrals or non-referrals from RTI to special education. Yes. So. Thank you, Jason. I think the next one we is pretty straightforward too, the lunch aids. So yes. I think it just helps getting some more information on the learning strategies. Sure. Anything else? Any other questions about it? Or? Okay. Well, you know, I, I, so just going back to the, to the learning strategist, that position is currently in place and it's being funded out of a, of a, uh, a grant? Well, no, no. And so right now, so that there is a person completing these tasks, it's, it's a speci special education staff member who is okay. also doing, also um, performing other special education tasks okay. as well. So this would be um, filling that void and, and enhancing what that person is able to do now because that person's in a sense for a year doing two jobs basically. I think it was an agreement to work really, really hard to get RTI up off the ground the first year. That's my sense, that's how it was presented to me when I arrived.
Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, um, John, we've got two minutes. I'm wondering if we hit the pause. So, do us. Um, there's two items in the middle school that look significant. So, if, if Troy's not Troy's here, Troy's not though. here. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask Howard if, if you thought it'd be worth speaking to those that are waiting, because. Um, well, uh, do you mean the special education teacher yeah. and social worker? Yeah. Well, I think regarding the special education teacher, I think that's still under review. And uh, I really would like to have a bit more time to speak with principals and Jessica. Um, it may be that there are ways that current staff could perhaps help fill those, uh, those needs. I, I just want a bit more time to, if you don't mind, have a, a conversation with them about that position, but um, it is the case that we have a handful of students that have some significant challenges that are either in the um, upper middle school or beginning high school next year, and one option was to hire some additional teachers. It may be that with reassigning current staff, we could fill that. I, I wanna just talk more about that, um, if you don't mind. Regarding the social worker, I believe what I understand is that we have, um, the, the middle school has the least amount of, um, of staffing in that area, and yet it is an area where the social worker that's there now, her time is largely devoted to meeting the requirements that are spelled out in children's individual ed educational plans, and there's no time left or precious little for working with students that do not have uh, individualized plans. And, and that's a shame because there are a lot of students outside of that group that, and their families would benefit from that kind of work. We, ha we have, I think it's something close to two social workers at the high school and about one and a half at Pond Co. Is that kind of what it is? Two full-time social workers at the high school and right. one and half at Pond And one at the middle. So we really, this isn't a matter of just trying to get it even, <laughs> Stephen. It's really, we just see uh, an obvious need there for some additional support. Um, and so I think it's fair to say, speaking for myself and hearing from others, uh, this is collectively, we think, a very high priority. May I speak to that yeah. as well? And I'd like to just reiterate, it's the middle school, <laughs> which is highly important to have support for those kids growing and evolving at those age, which are such a tricky age where we only have one right. social worker. So, and right. they all need it, but I think the middle school, they can get lost yep. quickly. So uh, I'd echo that in so far as also, as we talked about before in the how when we went through how we staff our schools, it's not only about the, the classroom teachers, there's a variety of people, and a lot of them have to do with getting students ready to learn, because if they're not ready to learn, they don't learn anything. Right. And in middle school, the social work piece can be a huge part of that. That's and right. so I would agree with you that this, in my mind, certainly is a very high priority item. Yeah. And I, I think that we'll probably leave it there for the night. Okay. May, yep. may I speak? Yep. Just, I know we're trying to close up, but there's, Two more items that I think just at least need mentioning for the public, and one is the school resource officer, which, yep. um, I'm sorry? Uh, yes. Do you want yeah. me to speak to that? You may certainly speak to that, and I just want to, the second one. and the, as yeah. well as the architect um, and engineer oh, okay. fees. I so, think that's um, very important to have that discussion. Okay, so quickly. just real quickly, at your earlier meeting, you received a, a list for called priority items not included in the initial budget for next year that totals $607,000. And two items that we've added since that meeting, for um, one is the, the, a school resource officer. We have felt, and, and remember now, last year we had talked about at the board level, uh, do we generally support the notion, and at that time it was unanimous. The board felt that it was a, a wise uh, direction for the district and we were waiting for a grant um, that might become available through federal funds. And, and, and this year, 
Also, I've heard people say that maybe we need to think about one for the high school and another for the middle school, not just one. So th what I've put in here is a ballpark cost of $80,000. That um, cost is, again, is not a hard number, and it would be split in some way between the town uh, budget and the school budget because this person for during the school year, he or she would be working for the school primarily, but the rest of the year working for the town. So it would be it would be split. Two thirds, one third. Right, maybe two thirds, one third, and um, and again, this is just one um, person. Now the architect fees, the engineering fees. I was hoping all along that we could separate this out and have it be a standalone article for the community to consider. Uh, this money, which is seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars, is money that would take the initial study. Um, several steps forward. It would, it would, it would, it would include really in-depth analysis of all of our buildings. It would um, require, it, it would mean that we would then have concept drawings coming out of that. We would have public meetings and presentations, um, and we would have some spe some specifics around that that would allow for a cost estimate from a third party to give us a sense of if this project was to go forward, what would be the bonded amount that we would need. So it's a lot of work. It's, it's much, much more in depth than the earlier Harriman study that you had done. That was pretty high level. This is much, this is very deep um, uh, analysis of current buildings. So we now know from our lawyers that if you, when you do put this in your budget, it needs to go in your facilities budget. And when you add that figure to this list, you've gone from, again, 607,000 round dollars now to 1 million four hundred and basically 50,000. It's a, it's a significant jump. But um, there needs to be, over the next month, a, a real analysis of this and perhaps a discussion with the town council about what we can support and, and what it means. Um, for, yes, I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Howard, mm -hmm. for those explanations. Uh, returning back to the school off resource officer, uh, I would just like to put another sort of comment and idea wrapped around it that it's more than just an officer in a building. Um, I have um, somebody in the community that I'm friendly with who is a principal in another district and they've had one for many, many years and say that, uh, that uh, SRO is like another administrator. They connect with the students. They fill certain needs that are super important. Um, and I'm just putting this out there, but if the if it's the will of the board, I would be happy, and he has offered to come next budget meeting and speak on behalf of the benefits. He just raves very highly about it, um, and I'd be happy to invite him if the board would like that. So on a similar vein, um, I'm friendly with the school resource officer for Falmouth, and he has offered to come and speak as well and talk about how the emphasis is on resource and not officer. Yeah. He, and, and, and just talk about the relationship building and, and what he brings to the district and to the students and to the teachers. So. I think it could be very educational to understand what that role means. You know, I, I mean, so, uh, it's a unique role and to understand the components of it and uh, that it's not just an officer, like what I, you said, I which would, may be a misnomer. I would greatly encourage that. I think okay. information is relevant. I think that it puts us in the, in the, in the right context with now as we sit here with heightened security concerns. Part of what the, the rational response to that is doing things that are sensible and also build community. Because um, I think in the long run, the, the, you know, it, it, the, um, that's what makes us strongest. As, as, and, we have, and the resource officer has a nice blend of that. And I'd be interested to be educated further about how that functions because it's another set of eyes and ears and persons who people who know people and know what's going on in your school 
that have the ability to catch things that are important before they head in the wrong direction. No? I, mean, I if I'm right, Jeff said you are not here next Tuesday night, correct? Right, and, and, and so if we're going to continue down this list, and one of them is his item about the literacy of French and French, do we? I can do it in two minutes. I'm great. Oh, okay. okay. Well, that'd be great if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you for mm -hmm. realizing that. Thank you, because I just was. <laughs> A lot to go. Yeah. Um, so th there are the, the word language position, which is a part time position that I'm looking for, is the one that. Um, if we don't get it, I'm quite confident, based on the bubble that we have in eighth grade right now, that we will not be able to, for next year, for the second year in a row, to offer either French one or Spanish one. Um, so that's that. In a nutshell, that's the impact on kids. Um, the literacy teacher position, which is also a part-time position, I think of these as potentially combined. I don't want to bore you now with why I think it, it makes sense to look at these together. Um, the literacy part-time literacy teacher position would give, for the first time in several years, a regular ed person who has some expertise in literacy, which we have not had for several years, and we definitely have needs. And this is the position that, in iterations of the budget last year, that I gave up this position and, and, and decided I wasn't going to fight for this because I wanted to get the custodian in the gym and the locker room, which I thought I got, and then I didn't. Um, <laughs> and then the computer technology person right now, this year, it's a growing interest of students. We are offering a program. Carolyn Young, who's our librarian, and Ginger Raspill, our technology integrator, have gotten it off the ground, but it means they are taking time away from Carolyn's job as librarian and Ginger's as, as, as technology integrator, and I'd like to get a part-time. That actually could be done with a 0 .4. 0 .6 would allow for some expansion. 0 .4 would simply allow us to keep where we are now, but allow somebody other than Ginger and Carolyn to teach that courses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think clerical? Thing, yeah, the only thing we haven't spoken to is the clerical piece, and then I wanted to do a brief summary of the, the architect piece that would give a, Okay. So, clerical. So, yeah. the, the clerical has to do with the business office, and as I was prepping for tonight, I realized we tried to, we, my department and I thought about adding this two years ago because we are short-staffed, And but what we did instead was we reorganized the office, we reorganized the duties, so we have now one person who does accounts payable, pays the bills, we have one person that does payroll, <laughs> we have one person does human resources and we thought reorganizing the staff would help alleviate or make things more efficient. Well, it hasn't. We are, as, as Perry was saying, the morale can be a little short and, and, and people are stressed. I'm having that issue in my department also that um, my, my staff is maxed out and when people are, we're putting out fires. We, we don't, we can't, it's hard to take the time to really help support our staff and do the things that we know that would really help communication and really um, just overall do help the school district better. So that's why that's been added in there. So next. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, oh, Elizabeth? Is there an offer, would any of these duties translate to, you know, the fact that you're a one town office? Would the town share in any of this cost? Prob yes. <laughs> so this is another one where we should probably talk to the town also to see if they would be willing to help cover the cost um, on that one. So it's a good question. You can wrap it up. Yeah, no, I was just going to wrap it up. I just wanted to come back and t briefly touch on what Howard talked about, which was the, the architect study. Um, that is. Uh, uh, covers, we sort of did a tour of the facilities and looked at the significant, we know these need to be fixed, capital improvements, including uh, entrance areas for the Pond Cove and Middle School and security around those, um, entranceways to the high school, there's a, there's a long list of things that are uh, redoing of the cafeteria, 
auditorium space which functions neither as a good cafeteria nor an auditorium currently. Um, uh, and, and looked at how these were the things that they thought <clears throat> would uh, capital improvements that would extend the natural life of the building to its full value. Um, and uh, those engineering drawings uh, and proposals uh, would take them to the level required to get a full estimate for what would be bondable. That's right. So it's about, I think, uh, they describe it. There's some community work and some other work that uh, goes along with getting the input of what's fully in the package and then fleshing out the drawings uh, to a level that says this is a number that we can bank on. Uh, so it takes it to like a, th a, a quarter or a third of the way through the detailed architectural drawings. And that's what that total figure represents. And as I think as Jamie pointed out last time, if you, know, if you uh, limit what's on that list, you, it will reduce, but not completely because there's still that outreach work that you that's need right. to do. So that uh, those materials and that letter, uh, what those projects are, are also available for people to see in the, the budget materials. That's right. So that's it for tonight. Thank you. Uh, for coming, and it's been a long evening. So. What is the agenda for the next budget meeting? I mean, how do you want that to roll out? Uh, do, I, I wouldn't. It'd be nice to know if certain people need to be here or not be here, or what. What do you want to tackle? I, you know, I, what I feel is missing is is a dialogue between the school board right now and, and you. Um, that wouldn't necessarily include administration to be there. What I feel is like what I was hoping to do tonight, which we haven't had time, is to is to really look at the calendar and strategize between now what we need to do, what we have, to, what we should get done between now and when we meet with town council on April 23rd, whatever date that is, 24th. Um, that's one thing I'd like to do. I was really hoping to get to it tonight um, because I feel like. You know, we're just absorbing the information, but we need to talk it through, process, and, and strategize. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think that's generally true. I think we've been through all the parts of the budget now. We've been through what's not in it, and, and, and to a certain extent, that now I think that there, we, we as a board uh, also have to have a, discuss, have a discussion to say, okay, now we've heard these things. Where are we leaning? Is this in? Is this out? Do we really need to trim here? What? what now we see it as a whole. What are we going to stand behind? What, what's, what's in, what's out? And, and th that we're, we're now to that point where we've been through all that, and, and we have still some other questions and clarifying and supporting materials that are sort of in process that will come along, things that have to do with class size and other but, but I think we, can have, to, we, can, we have to have that, that discussion now at the, as, as a board. Are the things we want to add, or are the things we want to say, we need to, can you go look at this so we can take these out? What, what are we going to do? Um, yeah. We're at that point now. We've been through all of, the, of the, the the big picture, explained the pieces, looked at the detail, and now we want to come to consensus to say, based on you know what we think is best for this school district and our priorities, here's the budget, and and we stand behind and and the principles that underlie that, and it's going to get us to these numbers. Suzanne Howard, uh, questions or requests for information should go to you mm -hmm. so that people can ahead of time. And I would like to reiterate, Hope had made a request around, um, maybe it would be good to bring the um, class size policy next time and a breakdown of um, reality. Like what, what, what are our actual class size averages right now? There's a, there was one from last year's budget session that I think it said just, just duplicate that. Yeah. Update it. Just update it. Yeah. Just update it. But I wanted to re just make sure that, that that request got up there. If we're saying that administrators don't need to be here, there might be some answers or work that goes to Howard and Susanna before. Yeah. We actually have those figures now. We can hand them out to you now so that you can look at them and then if respond you know, for any questions. So. That was like magic. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> so we're meeting in a few days, which yep. is good. 
um, on the 20th. And anybody who wants to come, feel free. Don't feel like you have to, because I think we're going to start just talking amongst yourselves. So it's up to you. This, these, this is Pond Cove and Middle School. The gets but the then Troy right. also <laughs> put the same data in an Real explanation time. of something <laughs> changed. So you probably want both. Yeah. So one of each? Yeah. Yes. Does that sound good? I mean, I can, I don't know if you want. I think there's 20. Yeah, yeah so. So this is somewhat duplicative. It is, except you put like yeah. an explanation on it. Okay. Oh. On your, on your uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Is this, uh, Jason, is this for the whole school? District, the whole district? So this is high school. high school? It looks like just high school, but it doesn't say on it. So let's label it. 